This morning, my question, what is the key to a woman making it in business today? Plus, the complicated controversy over Beyonce and Jay-Z in Cuba, and an intimate portrait of the most powerful sister combo in tennis. But first, the tax man cometh. But for whom does he come? Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Grumble, grumble, boo hiss. It is tax time. Listen, I hear you. I don't like doing my taxes. Writing that check to the IRS or even seeing how much I already paid is just ugh. And whether you're the kind of taxpayer who shakes her fist at the heavens while yelling about the man, or you just quietly tear your hair out in a late night TurboTax session that is probably going to happen tonight. We are all participating in that annual American ritual. I wonder, though, what really gets us down about tax season? So, so I started asking, is there any bill that you enjoy paying? Look, for some of us, that down payment on a new house or even the monthly mortgage check is a point of pride. There's a sense of self-satisfaction and being able to meet that debit which finances your home and hearth. Maybe for others, buying those back-to-school clothes and notebooks for your kids is the kind of damage that you happily do to your wallet. Or for the luckier among us, maybe even paying that preschool tuition that is literally an investment in the future, one that many college graduates have learned cannot be quantified in dollars and cents as much as an opportunity. And in fact, speaking of that, while I can't say that I love paying my student loans, and yes, I am still paying my student loans, I don't actually mind it that much because the years that I spent in college and graduate school were the most important investment I've ever made. And of course, giving what we can to charity and to nonprofits actually feels pretty darn good. I mean, knowing that your hard earned dollars are going to something that you choose, to a good cause, that can be a unique pleasure and we don't mind paying for those things. So maybe we can make taxes a bit more like giving to charity or at least like paying the light bill because in a certain way that's exactly what it is maintaining those collective utilities. As Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, known as, and I'm not kidding, the Taxing and Spending Clause of the Constitution, what it says is that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. It's that general welfare part that taxes are all about. And it is all around us. The, the roads and bridges that we cross daily, the National Guard that comes to our rescue at home, and the Army abroad, the public school teachers that educate our children. And while your tax dollars are at work constantly, it can sometimes feel like our dollars are just getting eaten up by a system. In fact, the average American believes that the federal government wastes about 51% of every dollar that it spends. So perhaps a lot of this frustration is coming from empirical evidence of the disrepair and waste that you see around you. But maybe it is also the mere feeling of frustration and lack of good information. There is no way around it. Taxes are complicated, so complicated that the majority of us aren't even doing our own taxes these days, preferring to farm them out to tax preparation or to somebody else. I mean, hey, you better bet I am not doing my own taxes. But new research says it doesn't have to be this way. We can, in fact, really fall in love with the Form 1040, with a, a little bit of rebrand taxes can be adorable almost. The Boston Globe noted this week a recently published research paper by two law school professors summing up their findings this way. If taxpayers were less scarred by the process, they would be less likely to seek out loopholes, put their money in tax shelters, or simply try to cheat. And if Americans really understood where their tax dollars went, we might all have a better appreciation for a relationship to the government. But hey, that sounds like a good thing. So when you hear about President Obama proposing nearly $60 billion in new tax revenue over the next 10 years as part of his 2014 federal budget, we should all just jump for joy. And if you still hate it, at least you could keep your vigilant self focused on how your government spends your money. At my table this morning is personal finance 
expert Carmen Wong Ulrich, president of Alta Wealth Management, who must also just be very sleepy <laughs> on the day before it's a very day. busy time of year. <laughs> Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Lisa Cook, back from yesterday from Michigan State University. She's professor of economics and a former member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And Josh Barrow, lead writer for the ticker Bloomberg Views blog on economics, finance, and politics, who also had a little bit of something to say to me this week. But we want Josh <laughs> at the table anyway. In fact, Josh, I want to start with you sure. because I feel like you've had a very balanced approach to thinking about sort of how liberals on the one hand get too anxious about the idea of tax cuts, but how how conservatives sometimes want to use tax cuts to solve everything. Right. Well, I think the, the Republican Party's economic message for the last 30 plus years has been so focused on the idea that taxes drag down the economy and in order to create jobs and, and prosperity, we need to cut tax rates. And they've been overly focused on that. And I think there's been an overreaction on the left to sort of talk about taxes as though they don't affect the economy at all. Right. And you can basically just collect whatever taxes you, you feel like, and people will work anyway because they love to or because they, <laughs> they still feel they need to anyway. Right. And really, I think what, what you need is, is a balanced idea in that. And I think where we are right now, where you have top federal tax rates around 40%, mm -hmm. I think that's certainly conducive to, to a healthy and strong growing economy. That's what we had in the 1990s. Um, but I think we've seen, like with the obituaries of, of Margaret Thatcher this week, uh, so much uh, condemnation of her from the left. When she came in in Britain, the top income tax rate was 83%, yeah. which was really way too high. Yep. Um, and so I think we, we had a good policy shift over the last 30 years, bringing those rates down into this range around 40 or 50 um, or, or 35, wherever they are. And I, I think that's appropriate, but I think we need to not lose sight of the fact that taxes do affect incentives. And when you, you tax more of something, you do get less of it. So part of what you're talking about there is an ideology, especially when you, when you bring up Thatcher and a sense of what we think taxes are doing in terms of either incentivizing or disincentivizing work and entrepreneurship. But I also was trying to make a claim that part of what goes on with our sense of angst about taxes is that we feel like we don't know where they go or we have misinformation about it. Dee, where is it exactly that Americans think their tax dollars go? Well, it is remarkable. I actually am amazed there's as much support for the system as there is, given where people think their money's going. I yeah. mean, people think half the money's going to welfare and the other half's going to foreign aid. Yeah, you know? I mean, <laughs> that, yeah. nothing like half, right? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, you know, you know, the main welfare program, if you want to use that term, TANF, that's about half of 1% of the budget. And you can throw in other programs, you're really hard pressed to get over 5%. And, you know, frankly, you know, again, if I thought 30 or 40% was going to these programs, you'd go, you don't have much to show for them. And, you know, it is it is unfortunate. And I, I blame the media here to a very yeah, great extent yeah. because you get, like, ritualistic reporting. You're beginning mm -hmm. by talking about $60 billion in taxes over 10 years. Yep. How many of your audience does that mean a thing to? Suppose it were right. $6 billion, suppose it were $600 billion. Now, if you said X percent of the budget, mm -hmm. you know, he wants to raise taxes by, yep. you know, say about half of 1%. I'm not sure it's the right number yep. here, but let's say it's half of 1%. Most of your audience is going to know what that means. I've raised this with the reporters endless times. I'm so, just so, just right, so, so the, the, the raw number itself isn't very meaningful. It's the proportion. And I just wanted to show there's a terrific book called The Submerged State um, in which the author asks people, you know, do you benefit from government resources? And the vast majority of them say, no, absolutely not. I do not benefit from, from government programs. And I know that's a bit hard to see, but what you'll see is that uh, upward of 60%, in fact, get a mortgage interest deduction, or they take the Hope Lifetime tax credit, or they have student loans or they have Social Security, or they have Pell Grants, or they have the GI Bill, or maybe their kids go to Head Start. All of those, my friends, are government right. programs. But i gotta, I got to also pull the politicians into this, because you know that what they do is, is they take taxes as a point to get people personally involved and feel mm. personally tied to issues. For example, Big Bird in PBS, or the mm. National Endowment for the Arts, saying, look at where your tax dollars are going. And they're not even dollars, it's a penny. So there's a real distortion as utilizing taxes as a way to get Americans to feel enraged about something because they're paying for something. So that's why there's so much talk about welfare states and all that, and they're saying, no, 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 I don't pay for this. I don't take advantage of any anything tax-wise mm -hmm. because all of the attention is paid to politicians saying these people are using your money mm -hmm. in the wrong way. And you disagree. Right. And one of the first things I do in all of my economics classes is to show where the federal budget is divided and mm -hmm. how it's divided. Because as Dean was saying, the first thing they go to, if you ask them, where is your money going? Where is the federal budget going? Well, if we just look at foreign aid and if we just look at welfare, if we cut those, the budget deficit will be closed. And then I show them that chart that you just <laughs> right. showed, right. and they're completely right. shocked. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, but it feels to me, though, like that isn't irrelevant in that when we start talking about tax policy, we're talking 
talking about politics. So on the one hand, there's this question of if if people had um, a different feeling about paying their taxes, but it, it actually then Im impacts the policymakers who, after all, have to run for re-election. Is this, is this why we end up with this kind of impulse towards you never raise taxes in an election year? Well, but also that's why it's also really, really hard to get rid of certain things like the yep. deductions and credits. For example, you saw that home interest mortgage deduction. Uh, yes. You know, it, granted, it may be fair to get rid of, but I can tell you that realtors and, and bankers construction, it affects so many people if that piece were to be taken away. So anytime you, you change anything tax-wise, yep. you're going to have a whole group of people, and a lot of them with a lot of money, yep. we're going to be very upset about that and want that not to happen. Yeah, also, the, the mortgage is just yeah. I mean, because, yeah. you know, I don't know anyone would say just get rid of the mortgage right. interest right. deduction outright. They might want to cap it. They might want to make mm -hmm. it a credit. Right. The vast majority of people would almost certainly come out ahead. But if someone were to say, okay, I'm going to cap it at 400, make it a credit so that it's, you know, 15% right. across the board, most people come out ahead. But you're going to hear, you know, the industry groups mm -hmm. come out there and go, oh, they're going to take away your mortgage exactly. interest deduction. And a lot of people are think they're going to lose something they're benefiting from. Right. But what right. if we just labeled it differently? What if we called it Section 8 for the wealthy, which is really what it is, right? It's, like, it's basically a government housing voucher for middle-income families, which we made a decision about doing in part because we wanted people to invest in housing. But if we called it that, we might have a different perspective reframing. on how much. Right, reframing it. Stay right there. We've got, we've got more on this because I do want to talk a little bit about the moral judgments about human behavior through the tax code. And quite specifically, I want to talk about whether or not we ought to smoke our way towards preschool when we come back.